DIY Brass Guy here to talk about some guidelines for big band playing and how to be the best big band member that you can. First thing that you want to make sure you pay attention to is what kind of instrument you play. Is it a jazz related instrument or is it more on the classical side? Uh, what chair you're playing in the big band it determines the type of equipment that you need. Let's talk about trumpets for a second. If you're playing lead trumpet, you need a very shallow mouthpiece and the, the most important thing to you is pl playing the high notes. And then if you're playing second chair, the high notes not so important, you need to be ready to solo. So you wanna have a great jazz tone. So you pick a mouthpiece that helps you do that well. The bottom two or three parts, you probably want a slightly larger cup. Uh, tone is a bigger deal and you're gonna be playing in, uh, in the lower trumpet register most of the time. Of course, with exceptions, I'm just talking in general here. Also, for trumpet players, you need to be ready to double on the flugelhorn. It's very common in the big band playing and to have flugel solos or even all four of you in the section playing flugels. So you need to be ready for that. The trick about it is it's hard to play it in tune. And then if you buy one that's maybe not the top of the line and it's not made with the overtone series uh, perfectly in tune, it's going to be even harder. So save up as much as you can and get the nicest flugel that you can because it's it's a hard enough instrument and you don't play it very often so it's harder to keep the chops up on something that you don't play regularly and if you do get a flugel play it as much as you can so that you keep your chops up on it so you can play in tune on it on the trombone if you're playing lead trombone or second you're going to want a small bore tenor like a 500 bore something very small I'd say first and second, both need to be able to hit the high notes. Lead, that's almost all that matters. Second trombone, you also need to be ready to solo. So first, you're going to want a really shallow mouthpiece. Second, you might want a slightly less shallow one uh, that'll, you know, you still want to be able to project, uh, but tone is a little bigger deal for, uh, for the soloist. If you're sitting in a solo chair, you're definitely going to have to have a signature sound that you want to come across for your solos. Now, if you're playing one of the bottom, uh, maybe third part out of four or even third out of five in a trombone section, you probably want a standard tenor trombone, a, a large bore, 547, the trigger, optional. Now, mouthpiece-wise also, you're also kind of right in the middle. You don't have too much extreme playing either direction. So just pick something that you sound good on that you can match the lead player on. Now, if you're sitting in fourth or fifth, you definitely want a bass trombone, a 562 bore, and then a large mouthpiece. Now, mouthpiece-wise, you want something that'll let you cut through, but that also uh, lets you get the, the low notes. So it's different for everyone about the, how, uh, how wide of a diameter you need, how deep of a cup you need, and what type of backboard, whether it's narrow or, or thick or uh, the diameter of the backboard. Those are your three factors when choosing a mouthpiece for all of these. And basically, as you get lower, the bigger everything gets. So a major component of sounding good in a big band is knowing what it's supposed to sound like, which means you need to listen to big band music. You need to listen to the bands themselves and then to the soloists in, of those bands. So we're talking Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Stan Kenton. You need to check out several albums by all of these guys. Uh, they have the best big bands in their times, and you need to understand the sound that we're going for. The contrast. It's not just all loud, and it's not all swing. Uh, there's a lot of different styles, and there's a lot of different grooves and feels that you need to become accustomed with and understand the articulations to use in those different styles. That's a big part of playing accurately in a big band. If you're sitting in a solo chair, you want to listen to soloists that are great on your instrument. Every instrument has different idiosyncrasies that you use with improvisation. So like a drum solo is going to be very different than a tenor sax solo. So you need to study people that are great jazz artists on your instrument, as well as others, but you definitely can't get by without understanding your instrument. I'll drop a list of great soloists and jazz artists listed by instrument in the description. Now, there never seems to be enough rehearsal time when you're playing in a big band. Some big bands just show up in sight read. So reading is a very big part of being in a big band. The rhythmic figures that are used in big band writing are all part of the jazz language. 
there is a finite number of ways to split up one measure, okay, in 4-4 anyway. Um, so by playing through these charts, you're exposed to them and you get more comfortable identifying them and eventually you're reading measures and figures rather than each individual note. Now, the rhythms also include articulations, tenuto markings, housetop markings, staccato, slurs. Uh, those are all a huge part of the jazz language. They're a part of the inflection. That's how um, you communicate what the composer meant to say by doing these articulations as well. Now, if you're listening up to your lead player like you should be, they should be doing these articulations and you want to match the way that they're doing them. The pitches used in musical lines mostly come from scales and arpeggios. You can make the most out of practicing just a few scales a day by playing a series on each key. So take a, a B-flat scale, for example. You'll play the B-flat major scale and then and arpeggio, the full range of your horn, as, as high and low as you can go. Uh, and then play the B-flat natural minor, then harmonic, then melodic minor, then maybe a B-flat blues scale and then do the arpeggios major and minor at the end of, of every scale. So get to, to live in a keys because that's what this is going to set you up for reading and improvisation later on. <laughs> as part of this series, you, you want to add the modes. So play the B-flat, Ionian, and then C, Dorian, D, Phrygian, uh, and just go all the way up and down, and again with the arpeggios, because these are things, these are going to become important when you turn to improvisation. <laughs> of the jazz language, there are a lot of specific elements that we need to match. Articulation, note length, volume, ornamentation, inflections, dynamic changes. It should sound like the lead player has four bells and your horn is just an extension of that lead player's horn. The second, third, fourth, fifth players all listen up to the lead. So lead player, all the articulations, all the style, all the note lengths, the dynamics, that's all up to you. When the members of a section all mirror the lead player, and then the sax and trombone lead players mirror the lead trumpet, that's how you get the band to sound tight. Here's some guidelines for solo playing. Number one, when you have a solo, stand up. Have your music stand in a position where you can read the changes before your solo begins. If the band leader has a mic for soloists at the front of the stage, be sure to leave your seat in plenty of time to get there before the solo section starts. Number two, if you want the rhythm section to do something specific during your solo, like a change of style or go to a samba, or if you want to substitute set of chord changes under your solo, like you want to do I Got Rhythm Changes, let them know before the song starts. Obviously, if you're in a band that rehearses, you have plenty of time to uh, talk about this and to set it up in advance. Um, but if you're on the bandstand and maybe it's your first time to play with this rhythm section, um, or it's the first time to play the song with guys that you normally play with, then make sure that you discuss that before the song starts. We'll talk more about improvisation in a separate video. That's a lifelong process, and there's many different ways to approach it. But at, at the beginning, at its very basic level, you, you do need to study some chord changes and just practice playing along with some. You can get an iReelB app or uh, play along with some Jamie Ebersolds online something, uh, any, anything, just to give you a chance to play through it. We have a lot of great resources out there. So take advantage of them, because listening and then practicing the doing part, that's the only way you're going to get better at this. Thanks for tuning in. If you subscribe, I'll let you know every time a new video drops. I'm DIY Brass Guy. Everybody can make great music.